It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Good day everybody this is the video about revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 22 now that is the final of the seven letters now this letter is to the uh, church in laodicea and to the angel of the church in laodicea write the words of the amen the faithful and true witness the origin of God's creation. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. When he did his ministry on earth, he was God in the flesh. He was the suffering servant. He was 100% human, but at the same time, 100% God. And he is the true and faithful witness because he was present at creation. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 clearly tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and um, nothing that came into being came into being without Him, all right? And the Word was uh, the light, and the darkness could not overcome that light. And then later on in verse 14 of uh, the first chapter of the Gospel according to John, we see that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when God the Father said in Genesis 1 verse 3, let there be light, it wasn't just the physical creation of light. It was him also affirming the light of the world. And that is Jesus Christ as the light of the world, as we also see in John chapter 8 verse 12. And that is why Jesus is referred to as the Amen. Amen is a Hebrew word that means may it be so all right now god the father said to moses i am that i am in exodus 3 verses uh, verse 14 and then we know that jesus made seven i am statements he said i am the bread of life he said i am the light of the world he also said i am the resurrection and the life i am the door for the sheep, I'm the good shepherd, and he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the true vine. Now, those seven I am statements uh, connect 
Jesus to God the Father. It shows the unity between Jesus Christ and God the Father. When God the Father said, I am that I am. All right. And also, you, you will also find subtle references to the statement, I am that I am, in certain other statements that Jesus made. For example, when he told the Jews, before Abram was, I am. Okay. Uh, referring to himself when he appeared to Abram as uh, Melchizedek, the high priest. Because we know that Jesus is uh, the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is the perfect high priest. And um, the sacrifice that he um, made on the cross, when he sacrificed himself on the cross, that is the perfect sacrifice that only needed to be made once. All right. Because by his blood we are cleansed. He is the perfect a sacrificial lamb he is the lamb of god and he is a witness of god's creation he is a witness of god the father's powerful uh, work um, he is a witness of god the F father's glory his um, almighty being his um, omnipotence okay i know your works Jesus now says to Laodicea, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. Now, you know, if there's, there are many things that the Lord hates, but if there's one thing that he truly despises, it's when people are double-minded. Double-mindedness is unfortunately something that is highly revered in our fallen world. Double-mindedness um, is, you know, people one day they say one thing, the next day they do the exact opposite of what they said yesterday. Um, the Apostle James also wrote about these people and he said that, um, you know, you should be aware of someone um, who is double-minded because they are unstable in all their ways. He said this in James 1. Chap, um, James uh, 1 verse uh, 6 to 8, he says, But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now the church in Laodicea had the same problem, they were double-minded. That's why the Lord refers to, to them as those who are neither hot nor cold. Okay? If you are hot, it means that you are on fire for the Lord. So are you on fire for the Lord or do you have a cold heart, a cold heart of stone that refuses to be made or transformed into a heart of flesh? You see, that's the question. The Lord does not tolerate double mindedness. He hates it. And you know. When I read this part of Revelation, then I also think of Jesus who said to the uh, rich young man, sell all your stuff, sell all your possessions. You are both the law, that's fine. But now, one thing you lack, sell all your possessions, get rid of all your earthly riches, pick up your cross and follow me. Did the rich young man follow him? No. On the contrary, he was quite... Um, unhappy when Jesus told him this and he turned around and he walked away from Jesus. You see, there you also have a double mindedness because this young man was righteous within himself. He thought that he could be justified by his works and he loved the world so much, you know, that he clung to riches, he clung to fame, he clung to being uh, known as a rich man, having this reputation as someone who is rich, who is rich, and who has a lot of riches and money and whatever. And when Jesus told him, "Listen, get rid of all these things, pick up your cross and follow me," he refused to do that. So here you have someone who wants salvation in Christ, but they refuse to let go of the world. So they are unstable. They hold to both sides. They are. Neither hot nor cold. They are in between. That's double-mindedness. Interestingly enough, 
People, people who um, study Freemasonry in order to expose it from a Christian viewpoint will also tell you that double-mindedness is a very slight tactic used by Freemasons. Double-mindedness is something that you will find in Freemasonry. You will find it in also in other occult traditions like the, um, the Rosicrucians. Um, I'm pretty sure you also find it in the Kabbalah. Um, the Freemasons will say, um, God is light. And then they will uh, read, the, read the, the writings of Albert Pike, who venerates Lucifer as the great light bearer. So they mean to tell you that they affirm the God of the Bible as the God of light. But then at the same time, they revere and respect Lucifer as this light bearer. And when you show them that double mindedness, they either keep quiet or they uh, fall into um, a blabbering of words with which they further confuse you. Now that's that's trickery. That's that's occult. That's the hidden knowledge. That's not the knowledge and wisdom, um, the treasures, the true treasures of knowledge and wisdom that we find in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Verse sixteen um, is quite harsh. The Lord says, "So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth." Um, in my mother tongue, Afrikaans, um, there's a translation of the Bible, which is an old translation. And in that translation, if I remember correctly, it literally says the words that they use to translate this literally means I will vomit you out of my mouth, which is very, very straightforward, harsh. The Lord does not mince his words. He absolutely despises lukewarmness he despises double-mindedness jesus also said you cannot love the world and love me he said you cannot follow god and mammon you must choose do you serve the light or do you serve darkness because you can't serve both there's no middle way a lot of atheists will say when you ask them where they stand they will say yeah, you know, um, the Bible sounds good to me, but I also, um, also, you know, atheist philosophy makes sense to me and Darwinism makes sense to me. So I'm kind of middle road. I'm kind of in between. There's no such thing as in between. You are either for the Lord or you are against the Lord. For you say... I am rich, you see, here you have it. The Lord now says to Laodicea, I know the things you say. You say things like, I am rich, I have prospered. Reminds us of the prosperity gospel, doesn't it? And I need nothing. Yes, you need something, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Get rid of your earthly riches. Once again, we see uh, exactly what Jesus told the rich young man. Sell your possessions. Give the money to the poor. Get rid of all these earthly things. Let go of it. Pick up your cross and follow me. No, Lord, I love the world more. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. My ego is so important to me. That's what a lot of people say in our day and time. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, this reminds me of one part in the book of Ezekiel, where the Lord said to Israel through the prophet Ezekiel, he told them, you, I found you naked, lying naked in your blood. He refers to Israel being a lost nation uh, who turned their back on him to worship idols, to sacrifice babies to Molech, to, to Molech and worship Baal and so on. And he said, I found you lying naked in your blood. The same thing here. That's why Jesus had the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because what did the Good Samaritan do? He saw a guy lying next to the road. Being beaten up. Naked. Robbed of everything. Robbed of all his possessions. 
and he stopped and he picked this guy up and he took him to an inn and he said to the innkeeper listen keep this man here until he is ready to go again until he is, he is healed here are money to pay here here's my money i will pay for him so that you can keep him here until he is until he has healed that is something that literally happened but there's also a metaphor behind it an allegory it is an allegory of how jesus walks and he sees you lying there beaten up by the powers of darkness naked hungry wounded he picks you up and he takes you to the father he is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through him Therefore I advise you, verse 18, therefore I advise you to buy from me gold, refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe yourself and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and self to anoint your eyes that you may see. Now when he tells them, buy gold from me, he refers to the gold of the new Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Gather for yourselves treasures in heaven not treasures on the earth okay and then once again we hear like we heard previously in revelation we hear about the white robes remember the color of white symbolizes purity when we are cleansed by the blood of jesus as the lamb of god uh, and when we will be with him in the new jerusalem we will have these white robes we will be pure we will receive a new body, a glorified body, all right, a new name. And to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and self to anoint your eyes that you may see. You see, once again, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve fell from grace, what was the first thing they did when their eyes were opened? They covered their nakedness with leaves, all right? Now the Lord says, I see your nakedness. In other words, what he's saying is, nothing can be hidden from me. You cannot hide anything you do from me. And in their worst time, Israel was like this. If you read Ezekiel chapter 8, you'll see. The people got so arrogant when they worshipped the Mesopotamian uh, false messiah, Tammuz. They got so arrogant that they said, we do everything in the dark. The Lord will not see us. The Lord has left the land. He does not see. How arrogant is that, that you, you reach a point where you assume that the almighty creator of heaven and earth is blind to certain things. He doesn't see anything that you do in the darkness. That is why Jesus said that everything that is done in the dark will come to light. You cannot hide anything from God the Father. And to anoint your, your eyes, self to anoint your eyes, this reminds us of Jesus who put mud on the eyes of people and he made them see again. And he said to the Pharisees, you say, you see, therefore you are blind. He, mean, he meant to say that those of you who, who, who glorify your physical sight, who say, oh, I can see, you are actually spiritually blind because you focus so much on the physical things you see, your spiritual eyes are blind. And that's why the prophet Isaiah constantly told the people, let those who have eyes to see, see. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. So are your spiritual eyes open or are your physical eyes open and your spiritual eyes blind? Is your spiritual, are your spiritual eyes open and your physical eyes blind? Meaning, are you blind to the things of this world? Are you focusing on the things of the spirit? That's the big question that we constantly need to ask ourselves. Leonard Ravenhill, a great preacher, um, had a quote written on his gravestone, on his tombstone. And the, the quote says, the word says, it's a rhetorical question that reads, are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? 
Think of everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Are those things, are you glorifying Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, by those things that you do? Or are you keeping yourselves busy with the works of darkness and thinking, oh, the Lord doesn't see that. He's blind to certain things. He doesn't see that. We all need to search ourselves. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to search our inmost being and look at the intentions of our hearts so that we know what we have to confess, what we need to confess. Are we blind to certain sinful behavior that we have? If we are, we need, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to show us the things that we do and we should confess them and break away from them. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. You know, Jesus said that he is the true vine and we are the branches. And God the Father is the vine dresser. Now the vine dresser is the one who, who waters the vine and who prunes the vine. And God the Father constantly prunes us. Now pruning is not a, it's, it's, it's not a, um, it's, it's not something that's, that always feels good. Sometimes it hurts. But it's necessary for growth. And that's what the Lord exactly, say, that's what he says here. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest therefore and repent. Once again we see the importance of repentance. In many churches today the word repentance has become a swear word. They, don't, they refuse to talk about repentance. Which is absolutely tragic to say the least. Listen. Now he says, listen, with an exclamation mark. Once again, those who have ears to hear must hear, those who have eyes to see must see. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. What more do you want? To be with Jesus on his throne, to be there in the midst of the Almighty Messiah, the Almighty God of heaven and earth, to be with him on his throne. We actually don't deserve that at all. I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, Jesus, uh, when he prayed for his disciples in, the, in John chapter 17, he said, Father, you love them with the same love that you love me. Now that's massive. Jesus is saying, Lord, these sinful people who go, who, who go astray so easily, I know that you love them with the same love that you love me. Keep that, keeping that in mind, now he says, just as I myself, you will sit with me on my throne, just as I myself, who conquered death and ascended to heaven, sat next to my Father. So he's giving us this place of honor, this seat of honor. And like I said, we don't, des we don't actually deserve any of this. But by the blood of the Lamb, we have been cleansed. And if we endure to the very end, we will be there with Jesus in the new Jerusalem. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You know, that last sentence is something that you feel like taking that sentence, writing it on a hammer and hammering it into the heads of the churches. Hammering it on the doors and the roofs and everything of the churches because there are so many churches in our day and time who are nothing more but new age covens new age satanic satanically infiltrated covens and they don't listen to the holy spirit they give heed to the doctrines of demons may the lord have mercy on them and may they repent before it's too late 
Let me uh, close for us in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is precious. Your word is the light that could not be overcome by darkness. Lord, your word became flesh and dwelt among us as Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, the King of Kings, the Alpha and Omega. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study your word. Thank you for breaking your word open by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, please bless all listeners who are listening to this video. Lord, bless them. Bless them in body soul and spirit lord touch their thoughts touch their hearts touch their speech their physical things that they do every day lord so that all their thoughts words and deeds will be to the glory of christ jesus our lord and savior i pray this in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen